Hello, my name is uh, Kathleen Azaro. I'm an assistant professor of anesthesiology with the University of Pittsburgh. And we're going to be uh, discussing about uh, geriatric anesthesia and aging. I have no disclosures to, to make related to this presentation. The fundamental principle of uh, aging is the fact that uh, um, our reserve decreases as we grow older and our ability to adapt to stress uh, becomes less and less. We may be able to maintain our uh, basal function, but our capacity to, to react to, to stress is uh, uh, significantly diminished. We usually reach our uh, peak maturity in our uh, third or fourth decade of life, and after that, the uh, subtle decline uh, begins, which becomes more and more accelerated once we reach about uh, 60 or 70 years of age. Um, this decline can be more accelerated in some people, the ones that we call old for their age, and uh, less so for some of those fortunate to be considered young for their age. This is another image depicting the same principle, uh, fairly uh, subtle decline in the third and the fourth decade of life and a more accelerated decline of our maximal uh, abilities as we reach the sixth and the seventh decade. Uh, the difference between the basal function and the maximal function of the organ is what we call the functional reserve and is the, whole, the diminishing of the functional reserve is the hallmark of aging. As expected, the physiologic effects of aging will affect every major organ system, and we're going to be uh, um, covering the most important principle about uh, cardiac, pulmonary, renal, hepatic, nervous system, and metabolic system. The cardiovascular system and the effects of aging. As we grow older, we have to uh, have a lower heart rate due to several factors, the degeneration of the sinus node and the conduction system, decreased sensitivity of adrenergic receptors, which lead to a vagal predominance. That explains why this uh, patient population has a high incidence of sick sinus syndrome and atrial dysrhythmias. Not only is our heart rate lower at the uh, uh, basal rate, but uh, we also expect a lower increase in heart rate in response to exercise the maximal heart rate will decrease by approximately one beat per minute per year as we uh, go above the age of 50. Elderly patients will have um, a delayed relaxation and reduced filling in early diastole, and they tend to be very um, dependent on the atrial contraction, so a loss of atrial kick can severely compromise the cardiac output. On the positive side, the systolic function tends to be preserved. This picture shows uh, the differences in the cardiac pressure volume loops in elderly compared to young patients. And we see that uh, the elderly patients tend to have a higher cardiac volume and um, um, significant cardiac dilation as they grow older at the virtually any uh, point in the cardiac cycle. This is how they are able to maintain their stroke volume and increase the stroke volume in response to stress. The resting cardiac output tends to be preserved in healthy, fit elderly persons, but the maximal cardiac output tends to decline sharply, about 1% per year after age 40, both due to the reduced uh, heart rate and the reduced capacity of increasing the heart rate and the prolonged relaxation and the diastolic dysfunction that accompanies aging. The elderly patients are different than the young in the way that they are able to increase their cardiac output in response to demand, whereas the young are able to do that through better adrenergic stimulation and tachycardia, the elderly rely mainly on the, increase, on the increase in the left ventricle and diastolic volume through the Frank Starling mechanism. And as we see here, the cardiac output is increased in young adults without a significant increase in the, in the stroke volume. But in the um, elderly individuals, uh, the stroke volume increase is um, mainly dependent on the increase in the end diastolic volume. 
aging leads to a reduction in arterial elasticity. Our vessels tend to become stiffer as we grow older, although atherosclerosis is not a part of the physiologic aging process. This usually leads to an increase in the systolic arterial pressure and an increase in the pulse pressure with little or no change in the diastolic pressures. Increased afterload can lead to left ventricular hypertrophy and in the end may cause diastolic dysfunction. Autonomic nervous system undergoes significant changes as we age, mainly due to the decrease in the better adrenergic sensitivity. We're going to have a lower number of receptors with decreased affinity, and that leads to decreased chronotropic and inotropic effects of the beta agonist drugs. In effect, the elderly patients um, act, display what we call the endogenous beta blockade of aging. So they behave like somebody who is on beta blockers even if they are not taking beta blockers. The baroreceptor reflexes will also be depressed. These patients will be predisposed to syncope because they have decreased responsiveness to hypovolemia, position changes, and positive pressure ventilation, which can be frequently encountered in the operating room. To summarize, the effects of cardiovascular system and uh, aging. We expect to see a decreased heart rate, both at rest and with maximal effort, a preserved systolic function, but with impaired myocardial relaxation, a decreased maximal cardiac output, endogenous beta blockade, and elevated systolic blood pressure leading to left ventricular hypertrophy. Pulmonary function can also be significantly um, affected by aging. Increase the stiffness of the lungs and the thoracic cage is the hallmark of aging, leading to reduced lung elasticity and also residual volume increases at the expense of vital capacity. We see in the next picture here. As we age, our total lung capacity tends to diminish slightly, but what's most striking is the increase in the residual volume at the expense of the functional residual capacity. We're also going to see a significant increase in the closing capacity, which is the closing uh, volume at which small airway collapse begins to um, occur, making these patients have a high risk for uh, atelectasis and VQ mismatch. Again, closing capacity it tends to exceed the supplying functional residual capacity by the age of 45 and the sitting functional residual capacity by age 65, which leads to a constant and progressive decrease in the partial pressure of oxygen on average of 0.35 millimeter mercury per year. And this slide here also depicts the values for arterial pressure or partial pressure of oxygen as we age and we can see a significant decrease as we advance in age. Elderly patients are also expected to have a decreased ventilatory response to hypoxia and hypercapnia with an increased risk of respiratory depression when exposed to anesthetic or sedative drugs. The cough and laryngeal reflexes are impaired, the mucociliary clearance is decreased and puts those patients at increased risk of aspiration and infection and pneumonia. Renal function is also affected by aging. Our renal blood flow decreases by about 10% per decade in our adult years and up to 50% of our nephrons may disappear by age 80. Glomerular filtration rate decreases about 8 milliliters per minute per decade, but usually serum creatinine remains normal due to diminishing muscle mass. So as we age, we expect our serum creatinine to decrease proportional to our decrease in the body mass. So an elderly patient with a slightly elevated creatinine may be masking actually a significant decrease in renal function since they are also losing muscle mass, which should actually decrease our serum creatinine. 
And here's another picture depicting the decrease in both renal mass and renal flow, especially. As a result of this um, effects of aging on the renal function, the elimination of drugs may be significantly impaired. Those patients can have delayed response to sodium deficiency. Their ability to conserve sodium decreases, so their risk for hyponatremia. They have reduced hormonal responses to aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. They'll have reduced capacity to excrete pretty much everything, whether it's acid load or sodium or water. They also have reduced capacity to both concentrate and dilute urine, being at risk of both dehydration and fluid overload in the perioperative period. Liver function follows the same uh, trend that we discussed uh, before. Significant loss of hepatic tissue up to 40% by age of 80 can occur with a proportional reduction in hepatic blood flow. So because of that, the liver function tests remain normal, but the reserve can be diminished significantly, leading to decreased drug clearance, albumin, and cholinesterase level, which may have clinical impact. The hallmark of aging and effects of aging on metabolism is a potential increase in the adipose tissue, usually at the expense of the total body water and muscle mass. So elderly patients can become bigger reservoir for anesthetics and lipid soluble drug. Also our oxygen consumption, both basal and maximal, can be decreased. And as we see here, comparison between young and old men and women. We have a significant increase in the adipose and the lipid tissue at the expense of the muscle mass and the total body water. The heat production can be decreased, the heat loss can be increased, so there are risks for perioperative hypothermia and also Due to the increase in the insulin resistance and decreasing glucose tolerance, those patients have a higher risk of developing diabetes. Nervous system is also affected by aging quite significantly sometimes. Elderly patients tend to develop progressive neuronal loss with a proportional reduction of cerebral blood flow. And unfortunately, the most specialized neurons tend to be affected the most, especially the neurons um, specialized in the synthesis of neurotransmitters. However, the autoregulation of cerebral blood flow remains intact. The degeneration of peripheral nerve cells can lead to prolonged conduction and muscle atrophy, disturbance of the sleep-wake cycle, increased incidence of sleep apnea, and also especially increased risk of cognitive dysfunction. Postoperative cognitive decline is a relatively new phenomenon being um, acknowledged in the perioperative period. It tends to be subtle and require neuro significant neuropsychological testing. As many as 50% uh, of the cardiac surgery patient can display that uh, three months after the surgery. The causes are still largely unknown, most likely multifactorial but it seems like the most consistent predictor of the postoperative cognitive decline is advanced age. And here's another graph um, showing the difference in cognitive decline between young, middle-aged, and elderly patients. And we see that, um, although that tends to be fairly significant, a fairly significant amount of patients having cognitive dis decline one week post, uh, post surgery, the, el the elderly patients tend to disproportionately display those signs uh, three months after the surgery compared to the younger and the middle aged patients. There's no magic bullet to try to prevent postoperative cognitive decline. There's no pharmacological means to treat or prevent. There's no evidence to suggest that the anesthetic choice has a significant influence of developing the, the cognitive decline and just the general principles that minimize the risk of uh, nervous system injury, avoiding hypotension, avoiding hyperthermia, hyperglycemia, and severe anemia.
may, uh, may help uh, our patients avoid postoperative cognitive dysfunction. Elderly patients will be at increased risk of delirium, um, especially elderly orthopedic patients uh, presenting with hip fracture, which can significantly increase the preoperative morbidity and the length of hospital stay. It's important to differentiate dementia from delirium, especially in this patient population, in which they tend to be very prevalent. Dementia being a permanent state and delirium being the result of acute pathology. And as we can see, delirium tends to be abrupt and with a short duration, hours to days, compared to dementia, which is rather insidious and persistent. And also there's significant, there are significant differences in the attention span, awareness, alertness, and consciousness that tend to be impaired or fluctuating in patients with delirium or more or less normal in patients with dementia. Many risk factors have been described um, for developing delirium. Um, there's an acronym that um, pretty much covers everything from drug use to electrolyte abnormalities, infection, intracranial problems, urinary retention, myocardial problems. Our elderly patients will be at great risk for delirium since all or many of those conditions are very likely to be encountered in the perioperative period. I'm going to switch gears and uh, talk about pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics in elderly patients. One of them looks at the, the pharmacokinetics, looks at the relationship between the drug dose and the plasma concentration, or what the body does to the drug, and the pharmacodynamics is essentially what the drug effect will be on the body, or the relationship between the plasma concentration and the effect of the drug. Elderly patients are expected to have decreased renal and hepatic clearance. They also have a reduced volume of distribution. As we remember, there is a reduced total body water um, um, compartment in elderly patients, and that can lead to higher plasma concentrations. They have a lower level of serum albumin, which can uh, decrease the protein binding and increase the drug availability. And also they have an increased percentage of body fat, which can lead to increased sequestration of lipid soluble compounds and prolong the elimination time. On the pharmacodynamic um, compartment, elderly patients will have increased sensitivity to anesthetic drugs with a decreased minimum alveolar concentration and decreased effective dose 50. And this next picture tries to summarize the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic changes in the elderly patients. We can see for a given bolus of drug, the elderly patients tend to have an initial higher plasma concentration and a much slower decrease in the um, elimination of the drug compared to the young patients, but also have a lower threshold for um, um, that drug achieving its um, stated effect. Elderly patients um, will have increased sensitivity to anesthetic agents. They do have a less predictable response to a given dose, although in many cases that response will be uh, geared toward increased sensitivity and overdosing, decreased clearance of drugs, and increased requirements for um, alpha and beta adrenergic agents in order to treat the hemodynamic instability that can many times accompany administration of anesthetic agents. We should try to titrate the intravenous agents very slowly. The onset of action may be delayed due to the cardiac output being on the low side. And also, we should consider using drugs that don't require renal and hepatic elimination, for example, cisatocurum, or are very short acting. A few words about uh, each uh, class of drugs that we uh, commonly use in our uh, uh, patients in the perioperative period. Benzodiazepines, the doses required for sedation can be significantly reduced in the elderly patients. The reduced hepatic clearance is probably more important in, in that effect. 
than the increased sensitivity. So the pharmacokinetic may play a more important role than the pharmacodynamic. Opioids, again, the doses can be significantly reduced, sometimes 50% or more. It may vary from one opioid to another. In the case of morphine, it may be the smaller volume of distribution and the decreased clearance that's responsible for that. Also keeping in mind that one of the metabolites, the morphine 6-glucuronide, also has analgesic properties as independent on, and, and is dependent on renal excretion. Whereas for fentanyl and sufentanyl, the pharmacodynamic changes, such as increased sensitivity, may be more responsible for the need to reduce the anesthetic dose. Intravenous induction agents, such as thiopental and atomidate, may have a smaller initial volume of distribution with higher plasma concentrations, whereas propofol can have increased sensitivity but also decreased, um, decreased clearance. Muscle relaxants can also be affected um, um, in elderly patients. There's usually a lower uh, level of plasma cholinesterase in men, which may lead to a slightly prolonged effect in succinylcholine, usually not clinically significant. But a prolonged duration um, can be a problem if uh, renal function or uh, hepatic function are significantly decreased for drugs such as pancuronium or rocuronium and vecuronium. Inhalational anesthetics um, display the same um, um, characteristics, meaning increased sensitivity in elderly patients towards inhalational anesthetics. It's fairly similar for all of them with a minimum alveolar concentration decreased by about 5 to 6% per decade, uh, meaning a decrease in MAC by up to 30% by age 80. And this is uh, summarized in this slide where we see a progressive and fairly linear decline in the MAC or um, minimum alveolar concentration requirements for elderly patients. And this table summarizes the pharmacologic changes that we um, just covered in the last few minutes, including all the major classes of drugs that we uh, use in the perioperative period. And as we can see, the common denominator will be decreased dose, sometimes significantly, whether it's due to the increased sensitivity or the decreased clearance or the combination of the two with the significant exception of drugs that are independent of both uh, uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, such as cis -atricurum. To summarize a few key points about geriatric anesthesia, the hallmark of aging is our progressive loss of functional reserve or decreased ability to adapt to increased demand. That's why the preoperative testing in, in those patients should not really be based on age alone, but rather try to assess the functional reserve of an um, elderly patient and also try to diagnose any the more common disease that are associated with aging. Elderly patients will tend to have an increased sensitivity to anesthetic agents. Usually lower doses will be required to achieve a certain effect and the prolonged duration of action can be expected. But also other factors such as comorbidities ASA status or the type of the procedure may influence the perioperative outcome more than the type of anesthetic or the choice of anesthetic.